to look at the roots of anti-liberty. Our journey carried us to Paris two weeks ago with Rousseau and the French Revolution. Last year, last week, we traveled to Moscow where we saw the Bolshevik Revolution as, as a fulfillment of Marx's thought. And then we saw last week four mutations of Marxist ideology uh, led by Lenin, Mussolini, Hitler, and this guy, Marcuse. And there were probably some quizzical gazes at that slide last week. This guy, who is he? I mean, we know Lenin, Mussolini, and Hitler, but who's this uh, grandpa with a cigar sitting on the chaise lounge in his backyard? How does he factor in? Well, today I'm going to tell that story. Today we come to San Diego, to University of California, San Diego, to be precise. San Diego? Well, yes. This is where Herbert Marcuse became the father of the New Left. That's what he was called the father of the new left, the Marxist mutation that has been revolutionizing America since the mid-1960s. Herbert Marcuse was the most influential of a group of Marxist scholars known as the Frankfurt School. They created the fourth mutation of Marx's thought after World War II, the Frankfurt School. Now, You'll remember from last week that Marx predicted mass revolution of the proletariat during the next European war. He said that in 1848, and when World War I came around, Marxists in Europe were eagerly awaiting for the revolution of the proletariat, but it didn't materialize in the Western nations. That was a faith-shattering experience for Marxists. And so they returned to the drawing board, developing alternative theories, mutations of Marxism to adapt it to reality. We saw some of those last week. What we're gonna focus in on is that fourth mutation, the Frankfurt School. The Frankfurt School insight was that Western culture and a Christian faith and commercial capitalism as it existed then had so blinded the working class in Western Europe and America to its true class interests, they were too fat, dumb, and happy, that the re revolution was impossible until Western culture and Christian faith could be destroyed. You had to do that before the revolution happened, not after. So Marx's class analysis alone would never accomplish that. So what they did is they pinpointed culture rather than class or nation or race in those other mutations of Marxist thought. They identified culture as a critical factor in bringing revolution to Western democracies. And together, this group of scholars founded the Institute of Social Research. That's what they called it in 1923. An interdisciplinary set of scholars to develop a new revolutionary method. And they were there in Frankfurt until 1933 when the Nazis shut them down. Okay? They then emigrated to the United States and they found a very warm welcome at Columbia University where they were all given academic positions. They developed a Marxist cultural analysis, not an economic, not a class analysis, that's what Marx had been focused on, a cultural analysis. And their basic critique was that prosperous, consumer-oriented Western democracies though they appear free, actually impose an oppressive false consciousness upon their citizens. 
that was just as totalitarian as the Nazis or the Soviets, just a lot more subtle. The ruling classes lull the working classes into complacency with shiny gadgets, with sexual titillation, with meaningless jobs, enslaving us in an oppressive cycle of being a production and consumption in a mass-produced assembly line sort of society that blinds people to their own oppression. Enslaving us as consumers and producers, limiting our choices in life. So how do you create a revolutionary proletariat in that setting? That's what they set out to do. Marcuse and his, and his colleagues developed several tools to achieve their updated Marxist revolutionary vision in the Western democracies. Several tools. I have five of them for you this morning. The first, an insider's revolution. Prior Marxist revolutions were bottom-up revolutions. This is how they saw themselves, rising from the streets to take power. Frankfurt School said, no, no, that's not going to work here. They advocated a gradual, covert, slow-motion revolution led by insiders, not from the street. Instead of marching in the streets to take power, these Marxists sought a gradual long march through the institutions that shape culture, education, the arts, academia, law, media, government organizations, corporations, existing political parties, entertainment, even professional sports. Any influential institution in society can be assimilated into the revolutionary cause. When radical insiders within these institutions use the credibility, the influence of those institutions to spread propaganda, to develop the tools of influence and coercion to condition people of all classes for the gradual imposition of Marxist ideology. They could make it cool for billionaires and celebrities to embrace the revolution. And they started at Columbia University where they had been giving a academic positions after fleeing from Germany. Now, you all know Columbia, it's one of the Ivy League schools. Columbia has the most prestigious school of journalism, the most prestigious education department in the country. Columbia journalism, Columbia education are the most prestigious. Columbia law is among the most prestigious. And from the 1940s, these Frankfurt School philosophers, scholars, resident at Columbia, were able to influence the training of generations of journalists, educators, and attorneys for the very elite, top-tier leadership of the nation. And Marcuse's own career illustrates how their influence spread from there. All right, so Marcuse left Columbia in 1952, and he went to teach at Harvard until 1958. And then he went to Brandeis until 1965, and then to UC San Diego until retiring in 1970. And after, in, in the nine years after retiring, he worked tirelessly across the United States and around the world to promote his ideas as a lecturer, as a trainer, of activists. And many of his Frankfurt School colleagues spread out too, carrying this new strain of Marxism within the elite pinnacle of, of American academia. And 50 years later, their influence pervades nearly every college campus in the country. It's pervasive. 
at UC San Diego, Marcuse was named, I think by Newsweek magazine, father of the new left in the late 60s. He taught and trained students, names, big names from the 19, late 60s, Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn, Abby Hoffman, Angela Davis were among many of his students. I mean, Angela Davis, she's in the news like in the last couple of weeks. She recently endorsed Joe Biden. Marcuse urged them to march on campus in the 1960s and then to enter academia for their careers for the long march through the institutions ever since. When Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn, after emerging from hiding because they were on the FBI's most wanted list for about 10 years for bombing police stations with the Weather Underground, when they emerged from hiding, they immediately got teaching posts, like at the University of Michigan and Columbia University, in education departments. How does that work? It's a long march through the institutions. Tenured radicals spreading revolution to the rest of the society through generations of college students in elite universities. Wow. First tool is an insider's revolution. Second tool, critical theory. In these academic positions, they practice what they called critical theory. It's a way of analyzing society and culture to reveal and overturn the power structures that control it. They went back to Rousseau's basic insight. Remember Rousseau in the French Revolution? His basic insight is that people are born innocent. It's the structures of advanced civilization that corrupt them from their natural innocence with inauthentic rules and manners, conventions and struggles and structures that create the need for hypocrisy. And this corrupts the innocent, natural human being. Here's a good example just to illustrate real quick. Um, criminal behavior. Who's to blame for the actions of criminals? Traditionally in Judeo-Christian society, we believe in individuals who have freedom to choose and are responsible for what we do. The finger of blame points to the person who made the bad choice to be the criminal. They are apprehended, tried, judged, and punished. But following Rousseau, Marxists don't see it that way at all. They blame, the, the finger of blame is pointed at the structures of society that create the context of this criminal's life. He's part of a collective structural injustice and that's why he does what he does. He's been corrupted from the outside. The finger of blame is pointed at society. Now, Marx focused primarily on class and economic structures, but the Frankfurt School broadened that analysis to all institutions, structures, ideas, and society. They crossed Marx with Freud to psychoanalyze the society. It's like the culture's on the couch for the, for the psychoanalysis in order to get behind the big narratives, the governing assumptions, the self-evident truths, the rules of etiquette, the constitutional structures and norms, patriotism, the story of our founding, to get behind all of this propaganda, as they call it, to expose the pathology and the structures of oppression that all this happy talk is intended to conceal. For example, maybe recently you've heard of the 1619 Project. It's a big thing that the uh, New York Times put on in July that argues that the hidden agenda 
of the founding of the United States is entirely about maintaining the institution of slavery. The United States didn't begin in 1776 with the Declaration of Independence. It began in 1619 when the first slave reached these shores. The Revolutionary War was fought against England, not in the name of the, the rights and liberties of English citizens. It was fought to maintain the institution of slavery. How's that for some critical analysis? Using critical theory, these Marxists argued that the social problems that we see in society are created more by societal structures and cultural assumptions than by individual choices. They rejected the liberal project of incrementally tweaking social incentives to stimulate socially responsible behavior to make a better society incrementally. No, instead Marcuse and his colleagues, they sought a revolution, as he said, to, to liberate human beings from the circumstances that enslave them. Rousseau could have said it. Only Rousseau probably would have said it better because Rousseau had a better way with words than Marcuse did. All right? This approach results in politicizing social problems, okay? My personal problem isn't mine, but it is part of the structural problems of society. It, 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 and it thus becomes a political issue. The personal is political. Does that phrase ring a bell? That was, that was one of the slogans of, the, of feminism in the 1970s. The personal is political. Everything is now political, which works if you're a revolutionary, right? Because everyone becomes a potential revolutionary. People can weaponize their pathologies, turning them into blame and rage against society. And that's what you see in the streets these days. Social media on college campuses. Personal pathologies weaponized into blame and rage against society. Now, critical theory in the last few years, several new phrases and concepts have entered our lexicon. Structural racism. Did you know what this was five years ago? No, you never heard that. Heteronormativity. Oh, okay, what's that? Um, patriarchy. Well, that one's been around for a while. White supremacy. White privilege. These are all directly derived from Marcuse's Marxist critical theory. It's all right straight from it. And the culture wars unfolding before us are the result of decades of what the Frankfurt School in the 1930s called cultural terrorism. That was their program. Sustained criticism designed to discredit and demoralize Western Judeo-Christian free market democratic societies. Marcuse's second tool was, is, critical theory. The third, an alienated proletariat, taking selfies while looting. Purple-haired lesbians running in and running out, shouting horrible things. An alienated proletariat. How do you get revolution? when the people who are supposed to want it don't. Now Marcuse figured out a way to do it. Rather than looking to the workers as a revolutionary vanguard, Marcuse focused on groups that had a natural antipathy toward mainstream society. He sought to create an, an alliance between radical intellectuals and groups not yet well integrated into 
society, the socially marginalized, outcasts, outsiders, minority races and ethnicities, the unemployed, the unemployable. They just needed to be awakened to their true condition, to the str hidden structural biases that are built into the system against them. And to these marginalized people, Marcuse added the disaffected children of prosperous middle-class and upper-class families coming into college. He sought to create a sense of dissatisfaction with the superficiality of materialist society, and he has plenty to work with, right? In a secular society where material prosperity replaces faith as meaning in life, there's a lot of disaffection and enemy that results. His strategy was to turn their spiritual ennui into a sense of inauthenticity, alienation, and, and, and oppression, to make them feel like outcasts. Even in the midst of unprecedented material abundance and security and leisure, consumer choices, career options, I mean, life is good! For you kids, what's wrong? He sought to create a sense of dissatisfaction with all of that, to make them feel subjectively oppressed, even though there's no objective forces oppressing them. Consciousness raising can wake them up to a new way to be authentic, to be woke. It's not career or family or material prosperity. It's not padding your resume. It's the cause of revolution and justice. This is the path, the new path to authenticity. We see it today. We saw it back in the 1960s. The Vietnam War was a perfect opportunity to drive home this point to a generation of students. Marcuse, because the draft was a direct threat to these students. And Marcuse gave them a perfect excuse. These student activists weren't draft dodging cowards, right? That's the false conscious narrative oppressed upon them by the structures of society. No, they are joining the crusade against Western capitalist imperialism. They are fighting in the streets of America in the belly of the beast for the, for the rights of Vietnamese peasants abroad. Marcuse was able to turn their bad conscience into a recruiting tool for left-wing activism. Wow. And that's how he won the young people. And next, there are African Americans, race, takes the place of class, with whites as the oppressors, blacks as the oppressed. And now more recently, Hispanics, illegal immigrants have been added to that mix. Now it's people of color. And then women. Women became the new underclass, with men as their oppressors. Oppression is monogamous family structures. The oppression of women. Which brings us now to our fourth tool, of Marcuse's revolution. The fourth tool is liberate the libido. All right. Marcuse and his colleagues knew they had to destroy Christianity and the powerful, oppressive, false consciousness that it imposes. And they discerned that the weak point in this day and age, that day and age, the 20th century, the weak point of Christianity with sexual morality. You subvert that and the rest would topple. And so they developed a program to liberate the libido, building on the works of others. In 1955, Marcuse published the book Eros in Civilization. And just look at that picture. See how transgressive it is. You got a leggy lady, all sexy sitting on a motorcycle. In this book, he crossed Marx with Freud. 
You see, Freud taught that civilizations were built by repressing and channeling our erotic impulses into socially constructive ways, like creating stable family structures, okay? Like productive enterprises in society. One man, one woman, one life. You got a lot of energy that is well-directed there. When left unchecked, sexuality can produce social chaos. And Marcuse saw in that the, the chance to liberate people in America from this repression and to foment cultural breakdown. His critical theory taught that, that limits on sexual behavior are instruments of oppression and conformity imposed from outside, from the controllers of society. It's the sexual repression of monogamy. It's the gender repression of domestic motherhood. And he didn't see it back in his day, but since the 1980s, there was the repression of gay and lesbian identity and embrace by heteronormativity in society. And more recently, it's a re repression of binary gender identity, saying that even male and female are false consciousness imposed from the outside. So to throw off all these chains, we liberate the libido, let it all hang out, the playboy culture. Marcuse called it polymorphous sexuality, the embrace of polymorphous sexuality, breaking all sexual taboos to experience sexual pleasure in whatever form one might find it. This became a personal act of liberation, throwing off my chains, leading to a social breakdown and chaos, which Marcuse expected would lead to social revolution, would feed right into it. And 50 years on, well, we, we kind of see what he saw. Freud was right. Unchecked erotic impulse generates chaos. We see that. Marcuse was right. Chaos leads to revolution and repression. And that makes Marx happy. And now we come to our fifth tool. Actually, I see in my slide that it is actually numbered four, but it is five. The fifth tool that Marcuse developed with his colleagues to foment revolution, Marxist revolution in Western democracies was repressive tolerance. That's what he called it. He applied critical theory to the idea of tolerance itself in Western society, in the democracies. And not surprisingly, he ended up wrecking it. He taught that the prevailing theory and practice of tolerance is just hypocritical. It's just a cloak for suppressing minority views. He believed that the only way in this unfair system of quote-unquote tolerance, that minority views, which he saw as the same as radical views, could ever gain a foothold in the public square is through repressive tolerance. Radicals had to vigorously practice in all the institutions in which they inhabit at any time and every place, whatever the decade it is, repressive tolerance. You have to practice what he said, tolerant, intolerance toward prevailing policies, attitudes, opinions, and the extension of tolerance to policies, attitudes, and opinions that are outlawed or suppressed. Intolerance toward the governing society, tolerance toward radical revolutionary ideas. Okay, it's very important. 
This has translated over the last several decades into intolerance toward right-wing ideas, priorities, people, policy, movements. Intolerance toward those on the right and tolerance toward all of their left-wing equivalents practiced in every place, in every time that there's an opportunity to practice it. Do you see any of this these days? Repressive tolerance? I mean, it's everywhere. Just this past week, you heard about the Girl Scouts, right? Did you hear about the Girl Scouts this week? This week, the Girl Scouts had to erase a tweet in which they congratulated Girl Scout alum Amy Coney Barrett for becoming the fifth woman on the Supreme Court of the United States. They had to erase the tweet and apologize for posting it in the first place. They had to apologize for congratulating a former Girl Scout on the Supreme Court. That is some serious intolerance. They were forced to do it. But when they congratulated another alum, Girl Scout Hillary Clinton, for becoming Secretary of State back in the day, were they similarly coerced? Yeah, you know the answer to that, right? Why? Because repressive tolerance rules. Another example, media scandal coverage, all right? So we've been hearing a lot in the last four weeks about a certain laptop belonging to a certain son of a certain presidential candidate. Actually, a lot of people haven't heard a thing about it because the national media has not covered it. Twitter banned the account of the New York Post who broke the story. And yet for the last four years, we've heard no end of coverage of every purported whisper of unsubstantiated leaks that might possibly implicate the President of the United States in malfeasance with foreign powers. But this laptop, it's crickets. Why? It's because repressive tolerance rules. Marcuse, Marxist revolution, the fifth tool repressive tolerance. Stacks of books have been written documenting other examples of repressive tolerance in our society. It's all any conservative can talk about, it seems like. Now, back in the day, in the 1960s, after Marcuse published his book on repressive tolerance, one of his critics said it's fortunate that the good professor lacks the means by which he might impose his opinions. He's just some grandfatherly professor with a German accent. He's harmless, right? No. Because from campus speech codes and safe spaces on most college campuses today, to social media corporations blacklisting unfavored ideas and those who promote them, to cancel culture campaigning to get employees fired because of their political donations 10 years ago, to boycotts on companies like Chick-fil-A whose revenues occasionally support conservative ideas, to the mobs in the streets looting and showing up in suburbs to menace people in their homes, to national media comprising a single narrative, kind of almost a hive mind where you listen to ABC, NBC, MSNBC, CNN. 
ESPN. And they all use the same phrases. To the fact that you do not feel comfortable sharing your political views in, com in public. You know, the Cato Institute did a study this summer that showed that strong liberals, this is how they, they did a demographic study, are the only political group in our society who feel comfortable expressing themselves openly. Strong liberals. Nearly six in 10 feel that they can say what they believe. Six in 10. However, centrist liberals feel differently. Half of them feel they have to self-censor, as do 64% of moderates in our society. And for conservatives, 77% believe that they have to close their mouths in public about what they believe. So nearly six in 10 progressives feel they can speak their beliefs. Nearly eight in 10 conservatives feel they cannot. Why? Because repressive tolerance rules in our society. Marcuse, his Marxist revolution, their program pervades our society. It's scary to see all these major power centers. And I haven't even mentioned the FBI and their selective prosecutions. All these centers of power practicing repressive tolerance in seemingly coordinated ways to demonstrate that the revolution of Marcuse's Marxist mutation is well advanced in our midst. Good golly. All right, so we have a couple minutes to discuss. Yes. Who forced the Girl Scouts to retract? I think it was probably uh, pressure internally among other Girl Scout alums. I think it was probably people within the board of Girl Scouts of America. I think it was probably the online uh, social media mob. Yeah. Very powerful forces there. What else? I'm sorry? Oh, um, I don't. Dan. Okay, so, uh, so the question was, do you recommend a book? And Dan recommends uh, William Lind, L-I-N-D, uh, from the Free Congress Foundation. He's got a 50-page book that can, uh, a short summary lays this stuff out. Yes, thanks, Dan. Yes. Okay, great question, Jen. Uh, is there any successful thing that you see going on against this? And um, I think I'll answer that question by starting with an image of a lion tamer. All right, so you got some 150 pound guy with a fancy hairdo and a, in, in tights with a little whip. And, uh, and on the other hand, you have this 850 pound lion uh, with claws and everything that he needs 
to, um, to dominate. And what is it that keeps that lion tamer safe? It's the training, it's the mentality that he has inculcated in the lion that the lion continues to consent to. And I think that in the face of what, of this insider revolution, the elites, these power centers, and the, the influence that they have everywhere, inside our own heads, that the, the best thing we can do to resist this and to win, ultimately, I think we will win because you know, the problem with Marxist ideologies is they are all in a fierce argument with reality. So we've got like this whole thing called reality on our side and they want to change that and they have a long track record of trying really hard to change reality, but in every case, who has won? The, the radicals or reality? Reality, the truth, will win. And, as, uh, and so we've got, these, we've got those pictures there, and I think that we can be confident and we can resist this like a lion might say, you know what, I think I don't want to keep taking commands from this skinny little guy in tights with a big hairdo and a snappy whip. So the means are there, and I think that uh, you can see in our society, uh, in po unfortunately, uh, most of it's happening in the political realm, which is not really, right? So the cultural Marxists have been working broad-based at the cultural level, level with politics following, and the, our mindset can't be, well, we just got to get the right people elected. I mean, that, it's, it helps, but um, ultimately it starts down here the stories you tell, with the lives you live, with the communities you create, with the witness you bear, and that's where we have power that often, oftentimes we, we, uh, we don't use it because we're like in that 77% who are like, well, I'm just, I don't wanna get in trouble. I don't wanna get anybody in trouble here. So, um, one more, our time is up, but one more. Mom. Um, we're talking about the church. Yes. Yes. So the question is, are we talking about the church? We are talking about the church. And, uh, and you know, Jesus said the meek shall inherit the earth. And he's not just talking about some eschatological thing. The meek are people who acknowledge the creator God, who are able to, to gain wisdom, to get in touch with reality, to like stand on the bedrock of reality. We build our house on a rock. When the storm comes, uh, the, the house built on the sand gets swept away. The house built on the rock, it stays. And, and so we are that people. We strive to be that people even better and to welcome others into it, to bear witness as the church. We will survive this. We will thrive through it. You know, one way of looking at the madness of the mobs today is it could be a light stage sign of their failure, their impending failure, the madness that precedes a vast overreach and a repudiation. And ultimately it comes from good people who are not cowed, who have the courage to bear witness to live, not just speak a better way, and to model it for others and to bring others in. I think that's how we resist and win. You were exposed to the same stuff. No, my parents didn't, didn't lecture me on it. They were thrilled that somebody in the family was going to go to college. And they, you know, had a shot at an education. They didn't, they didn't know what was going on. But I didn't know what secularism was. I faced, I saw it. I, I now know what I was, what I was dealing with. Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, what Buddy is saying is telling the story of when he went off to college and what he faced and, and as we send our kids off to college to prepare them for what they are about to receive, not just an education, but an indoctrination. Uh, in many, most of the campuses that they will be on, they will be subject to Marcuse style, critical theory, indoctrination. They will be recruited into activism, into alienation, into the new proletariat, and to send them away prepared for what they'll face. All right, got to hang it up there. Thank you all for being here. Good conversation. And thank you, Josh and Calvin, for uh, making the recording. God bless you all. And vote. <laughs>